What are we going to talk about, about uh, optimizing LLM performance uh, with open telemetry? Uh, let us introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Ashok Chandrasekhar. I'm a senior software engineer at Google. I work on A inference uh, workloads performance optimization, and I'm also leading the benchmarking and metric standardization effort in Kubernetes serving working group. And I'm Ludmila Malkova. I work on Appen Telemetry and uh, on Azure client libraries. I'm a technical committee member and a maintainer of Open Telemetry semantic conventions. So we are going to start with a quick intro. Uh, what's special about uh, LLM Gen AI, you call it. Uh, we will talk about the observability needs of uh, Gen AI applications and workloads. Uh, we will quickly dive into client side of the telemetry things, and then Ashok will take over and talk about uh, the model server side. We will do a quick demo and uh, talk more about auto scaling and the server side of things. Finally, we hope we can influence you to come contribute to some of the things we are working on if you are interested, and we are going to share how you can participate. Okay, so um, LLMs are getting more popular, uh, but also self-hosting LLMs is getting very popular. Um, for example, Hugging Face has more than a million models hosted now and a very active community of people. Um, Kubernetes is becoming a preferred platform to host these workloads, and there are new capabilities uh, being introduced for uh, specifically for AI ML workloads. Um, okay, so in terms of performance and observability, what's special, right? So first, it's, it's a new technology, it's growing really fast. Uh, there are a lot of new usage patterns, and uh, they have kind of high complexity, right? Uh, the uh, responses are not deterministic. We now need to evaluate them. We need to record this telemetry in a certain way. Um, and also on the server side, the operations are kind of different than when you serve the HTTP APIs. And we need different insights into this very compute and data intensive uh, workloads. And to be fair, we, we just don't know how to use the thing. Right? We, as an industry, we are all trying to figure out how to use LLMs and what does it mean to, for it to be optimal, then um, how, um, how to get insights into it. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's dive into the client side first. Um, so on the client side, uh, as a member of OpenTelemetry, I'm going to talk about OpenTelemetry. We are working actively on uh, defining semantic conventions and building instrumentation libraries. Let me quickly uh, share what it means. So um, we want people to use a re uh, some instrumentation. It, should, it will be high quality. It will emit telemetry according to conventions, which is a contract between uh, something that produces telemetry and some other people or tools that consume it. You can build dashboards, you can build alerts, you can build queries, visualizations uh, based on this contract. Uh, and we need to define what, what telemetry we're going to emit and what, what this contract is so that somebody can um, uh, build stuff on top of it. Um, okay, so we provide some basic, uh, the baseline uh, for typical performance analysis and monitoring, debugging, but also there is a Gen AI specific context like prompts, completions, uh, parameters specific to Gen AI, um, and we're working on evaluations. Okay, um, in terms of more practical things, uh, let's look at the distributed trace uh, that describes a specific operation. Here, uh, if you're not familiar with it, we have a incoming HTTP call, uh, there is a first call to the model, um, which has underlying HTTP call. Then the model tells us, okay, go, go call the current weather tool. We're calling the tool and oops, uh, during the tool call, we get some transient error. It's retried several times. Finally, it succeeds. We send the second response to the model. And now we see we are being throttled. 
we get HTTP 429. So if you look at this, there are 20 seconds, but you probably can guess how to optimize this performance, right? You can look into the transient failures on your weather API, and you might want to do something about throttling. Uh, so things are good on the client side. If we want to look into Gen AI specific context, here it is. Uh, there are attributes on the things we saw in the previous picture. So everything here is a span. Uh, and here are the attributes of a specific span. We can see a specific uh, response uh, model. We can see usage tokens and other stuff. Um, okay. Some people want to capture prompts and completions. As somebody working on telemetry, I still have uh, some reservations about it. But yeah, people want it, so why not? Uh, we are doing it as opt-in, so because it's sensitive, it's extremely verbose, but you can opt into this. Uh, and get the full prompts and completions. The cool part about it that we use, uh, it's called events, log-based events. Uh, the cool part about them, they are structured and they're named. So here, for example, this is Gen AI user message. And every time you get this event, you, should, you can rely on it having a certain structure. So you can parse it, you can visualize it, uh, you can depend on the structure. Still experimental. Um, okay. Traces are awesome for individual flows, but sometimes you want to understand the overall state and house, right? You kind of uh, know both how the individual flow goes and how the overall thing works. So we define a bunch of metrics, there's some boring stuff throughput, latency, histogram, this percentiles, uh, genetic specific stuff like usage rate. There are more to come, especially for streaming and stuff like this. And there is even more boring stuff like CPU, memory, HTTP, databases, whatever you can get from uh, the VisOpen telemetry from your application that uses AI and also something else. Okay, so Client telemetry, awesome for the client things. The moment you start self-hosting your models, you need a different kinds of tools and observability. You need to understand how your deployment goes, how you auto scale, and how to manage your resources. And this is where Ashok will tell us how to do this. Yeah, thanks for going over the client side. So there is this other side, right, which is how does our server do? Uh, so we'll talk about model server telemetry, what does it mean to measure performance, and how you can optimize it. Uh, so before we measure performance, we need to define what performance is from the model server side, right? Um, traditionally, you would have throughput and latency in terms of request per second and uh, how many milliseconds or seconds it takes per request. Uh, but with LLMs, all of it is in tokens, right? Because you have these long context models, which can take an age for you to get a response back. Um, sometimes it can be 30,000 tokens or more. Um, usually it can be like 30 to 60 seconds, so you want to measure in tokens per second. Uh, so with throughput, we have output tokens per second, which tells you how many tokens you are actually generating. And you have input tokens per second, which is your pre-fill phase, which tells you how many tokens there are in your prompt that your model is ingesting, right? And with latency, we have uh, time to first token. Uh, time to first token is probably the most important latency metric because it tells you how long it takes from the time the end user sends a request to the time you get the first token back, right? Uh, and then you have time per output token. Time per output token is the time you spend uh, getting each successive token after your first token itself comes. This is important too. Um, and then price perf, right? All of these models are running on accelerators, which are very expensive. So knowing what kind of performance you are getting for the price you are paying is important. This is usually measured in dollar per million output tokens or input tokens. If you are subscribed to like uh, Gemini API, Chat GPT, Vertex AI, any of those, uh, you would be paying dollars based on the tokens you are consuming, right? So these are like the basic set of metrics we want to use to tell how good our model is performing. Uh, now let's look at some of the metrics uh, that allow us to measure performance. On the right, you are seeing the VLLM dashboard on Grafana. Uh, this has a whole bunch of metrics. Uh, you can kind of categorize them into uh, the categories that are listed there, right? One is how much load is your model server uh, currently facing? 
And two, how much capacity does your model server have? Uh, what capacity is it operating at now? What is the maximum capacity it can go to? Uh, and then latency around how long it takes for your request to be admitted and how long it takes for inference itself to happen. Uh, so all of these things we can measure. Um, so it's more than just observability, right? You have all these cool metrics uh, that you can observe, but what more can you do with it? Uh, one, you can build performance profiles of your models uh, because anytime you want to run, an, uh, run a model, you want to actually look at whether this accelerator makes sense for me running this model on this accelerator, will it give me the best price proof? So by getting these metrics, you can actually formulate performance profiles. Uh, I will discuss later how you would do that. Um, and in addition to that, you can also uh, kind of do intelligent load balancing, right? Load balancing is also different from traditional web applications uh, because of the long running requests. You need to know uh, what load a model server is under to be able to load balance effectively. That is something you can do with these metrics as well. And uh, you can do intelligent auto scaling too, right? Some people might be focused on uh, maximizing throughput. Others might focus uh, uh, might be focused on ultra low latency, right? So auto scaling for these two uh, different scenarios also changes. Uh, and at last, uh, because all of these model servers have a good queuing system to queue the requests as they come in, you can do different sort of scheduling with it. You can do priority based scheduling. You can do fairness based scheduling, and all that. Uh, so far, we saw uh, the client side and model server side telemetry that is available. Now let's put this in action and look at a demo where we uh, identify an issue with our setup and then we debug it and then we optimize it. Okay. Okay, so in this demo, we are going to start with this awesome UX I created. I cannot center div as you can see. Anyway, so we're going to submit a prompt and get a completion, and it's nice and fast. Everything is awesome. Uh, so let's let's do it again. Um, okay, we're submitting, and you know this time it takes a while. So this time it's going to take about twenty seconds. The response is the same. Everything is fine, but it's it's kind of long. So let's look into the traces and see what happened there. So we're going to find the long one, uh, the one that took 22 seconds. Remember the previous trace I showed, it also took 20 seconds, but there were a lot of things going on there. Here, there's just one call and the whole HTTP call to VLLM server takes around 20 seconds. There is not much on the client telemetry that could help us. And we can at least look and see, okay, this is the endpoint and the API we called. Everything seems to be fine from the client side, but where, where did we spend this 20 seconds? Okay, let's also take a look at the metrics. In this application, we report uh, metrics to Prometheus from our client and also from VLLM itself. Um, they are published or uh, uh, using uh, the Prometheus operator and uh, okay let's let's take a look at the dashboards uh, you've seen the previous one about the client there is not much interesting going on except you see that the duration is actually went very high it went from something around zero uh, to p50 is around 30 seconds now uh, so yeah the metrics just show what we've seen uh, in the traces, but now we know that it happens on P50. It's not an outlier, it's the new normal. Yeah, so now we are looking at the server side. So we saw the request was taking too long and we know that the latency is coming from the server side. Uh, now when I look at the server side, uh, you can see the end-to-end -end request latency here, which was around like 2.48 seconds, P99. Uh, started going really high, right? Uh, the server is facing a lot of load now, uh, which is resulting in uh, increasing uh, request latency. Uh, and you can also see uh, from this graph on the right, uh, the throughput has really gone up. Obviously, sending more load uh, increases the throughput, uh, but latency is really suffering for us, right? Um, this is the time per output token uh, latency chart. Uh, it tells you how much time it is taking per token. This has gone up uh, significantly as well, P90 reaching like uh, around two seconds, and time to first token 
uh, which was like one second uh, or less is now at close to 10 seconds, right? This is not a good uh, user experience at all and we need to do something about it. Uh, I'll show you some more uh, interesting things here uh, before uh, we go on to what we do to address it. Uh, the scheduler state one is interesting. It tells you how many requests are currently in flight. Uh, you can see there are 754 requests running, which is a lot. Um, and that's sort of like the cap where you are seeing like there are more requests starting to get queued, right? And we are uh, reaching up to like 400 uh, requests which are queued and no work is being performed on them. Uh, so then I look at uh, the cache utilization, uh, which has gone up to like 99%, which tells me that the model server is operating at limit. Um, what GPU cache usage usually tells is how much memory are you using for your KV cache. Uh, usually KV cache is uh, needed to store your key and value vectors when performing inference. So it's a good indicator of uh, how uh, overloaded the model server itself is. Um, I have a few more uh, interesting metrics here that I can look at. Uh, there is the prompt length distribution, uh, which has gone from a few tokens to like uh, thousands of tokens and a whole bunch of requests, uh, sending in like thousands of tokens and like requesting 500 tokens or so. Um, and I can also see uh, the finish reason. Uh, you can actually finish a request for a couple of reasons. One, the uh, model itself uh, decides uh, I'm done. Uh, the other is when you hit the maximum token limit, right? Um, so I have refreshed this dashboard now. Uh, you can see uh, the load has gone up and now it's starting to come down uh, with the KV cache utilization, request latency, all of it is starting to drop. Um, and you can see how bad it was. It was uh, hitting up to like one minute, P90 and all that. So now let's address it, right? So I see that a burst came in. Now I'm going to set up auto scaling to handle this burst in traffic better. Uh, so here I have my horizontal pod autoscaler uh, configuration. Uh, you can see uh, it is operating on the VLLM deployment that we have. And I am setting my min and max replicas to one and two. Two is the maximum number of GPUs I have on this mission. Um, and you can see what metric we are using to do our autoscaling, right? I have set, it, set up to use this custom metric called VLLM GPU cache usage percentage. So basically we have set up Prometheus to scrape this metric from VLLM and uh, use it in a way when we hit like 50% uh, cache usage, that is when I want to scale up. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, create this uh, HPA config. Now when I describe it, uh, I can see that uh, the config was successfully created and it shows that uh, the VLLM GPU cache usage percentage uh, threshold is set at 50%. So anytime now it goes above that, uh, HPA will trigger a scale up. Uh, I'll give a couple of seconds, and then when I describe the HPA again here, uh, we can see that the HPA has uh, started acting on this. Um, so you can see uh, the HPA is now looking at the VLLM deployment, and you can also see uh, the current number of pods is one, and desired is one, uh, because HPA actually found the metric, it realized that it is within the desired range, um, and no scale-up is needed at the moment. Uh, next, we will look at a uh, new uh, spike in traffic that is coming up. This time, we are better equipped to handle it because we just set up HPA. Um, so we are making one more request from the chat client. You can see it is taking some time, not as snappy as the very first time we did it, uh, but not too bad as well. Uh, so now I go into my dashboard to look at it. I can see the request latency start to go up. Uh, it is not uh, reached uh, the peak yet. Um, and I can also uh, see the other metrics uh, that are here. So P90 is, a, it about, is at 40 seconds, and we can see uh, there are like a lot of requests that are starting to add up. We are at 183 to like 400 requests now. Um, cash utilization, this is what we set our HPA threshold on. Uh, that one has reached around 67%. Um, and time to first token is not terrible yet, uh, but it is uh, at around two seconds. So you might be wondering, hey, uh, did this guy not set it up to auto scale at 50%? What is going on? Uh, so we did set it to auto scale at 50%, uh, but uh, there is some lag from when the auto scaling happens to when the model actually starts serv servicing requests, right? Uh, so we will see uh, what happened in the HPA here. Um, 
So in HPA, we can see that uh, it is recognizing that the KV cash utilization is at 69% now uh, compared to 50%, which is when we should auto scale. And HPA has already triggered auto scaling now that the current number of replicas is two, which is the desired number. And you can see that the auto scaling happened like 116 seconds ago. But because the model had to be loaded into memory uh, because of the longer startup time, uh, it is happening late, right? Now you can see this second um, uh, yellow line that is coming up on the cache utilization. So that is our new part starting to uh, serve requests. You can also see from the number of requests running that uh, the new part is starting to serve more requests. Uh, now when I run this again, uh, it takes a couple of seconds, uh, but it is getting a little faster than before. Uh, and if I go in here, we can see that the cache utilization on the first part start to come down as the a new one starts to rise up, right? And after a few more seconds, um, the traffic has been going on for a while now, but you can clearly see the difference from the first time to the uh, second time that we did it, right? Uh, we hit really high end-to-end -end latency up to like four minutes. Now we are uh, being closer to around 50 seconds maximum. Uh, time per output token doesn't change much, uh, but time to first token from what you can see here is really low, right? Which is one of the main metric that we wanted to minimize. Uh, which we are able to do with auto scaling. Uh, from the cache usage percentage also, you can see we were hitting 99% before, but now when we were at about like 68%, uh, the new model server part came up and it kind of saturated at around 30% load on each of the parts, right? Um, yeah, and TTFT, as you can see from there, was 981 millisecond, whereas previously it was like 10 seconds. So just by setting up this auto scaling uh, based on uh, the KV cache usage percentage, we are able to really uh, bring down the latency that we were experiencing before. And thanks to all the uh, metrics that we have, uh, this makes it easier for us to do. So that's our demo. Let me switch over to the slides. Okay. So we saw how you can set up auto scaling. Now I want to talk about some of the uh, challenges with auto scaling uh, Gen AI or LLM workloads, right? First, it is not as simple as web server auto scaling where you usually set it up to CPU utilization and it just works, right? Then you might have a question, why not use GPU utilization? Because these are running on GPUs and that should be a good indicator, right? Uh, from our experimentation, we found out that is not often the case. Uh, we will discuss more in the next slide. Um, one other challenge we see is the longer pod startup time. Uh, we experienced that in the demo as well. It took like two minutes for the pod to load the seven billion parameter model. Uh, so that is a considerable amount of time when you are not reacting yet, right? So that is something we need to address as well. Um, and the last challenge is there are different use cases, right? Not all Gen AI workloads are same. Some could be uh, offline inference where you might want to maximize throughput. You don't worry too much about latency. The other could be latency sensitive where you really like code completion, right? As you're typing, you want to see the suggestions come up. So how do you auto scale for these two different workloads? That's the challenge as well. Uh, so we saw the challenges. So what kind of metrics will help us? And uh, how does hardware metrics like GPU utilization compare with model server metrics that we saw just now, right? Uh, there are a lot of GPU utilization metrics available. Uh, you have uh, the duty cycle, which tells you how much of the time you're using your GPU. And then you have power usage. Um, you have memory bandwidth usage. There are a bunch of others that you would get from a DCGM uh, as well. Uh, but there is not a single GPU metric that we can reliably set that will help us with auto scaling. Uh, the reason is the nature of the inference workload itself and the different bottlenecks it has. So when you are loading a model uh, into your accelerator, the first bottleneck you would encounter is how much memory you have for the model weights and the KV cache, right? Usually this is the first bottleneck you'll hit, but if you are able to do that successfully, the second bottleneck you might have is the memory bandwidth, right? How many bytes are you able to transfer into your GPU memory per second? Uh, once you get past that is when you hit, actually become compute bound, right? So based on which model you are using, what your accelerator is, and what model architecture you are using, uh, you can hit any of these bottlenecks. So you can't use a single GPU metric to actually do scaling well. Um, so we need to take a workload-centric approach, like the one we just saw, where we look at the load and capacity of the model server to be able to do auto-scaling successfully. 
Uh, this will actually uh, depict this very well. So this is a performance profile of a model uh, running on an accelerator, and you can see latency on the x-axis and throughput on the y-axis, right? Uh, we vary the load and see what happens. Uh, so as you can see, as we increase the load, all the blue points you are seeing um, is that latency in increases a little bit, but throughput increases a lot because we are able to handle more requests uh, in parallel. And then we hit an inflection point, which is the green dot you are seeing, where you have achieved maximum throughput you possibly can. Right? And then things get really bad where latency continues to increase a lot, but you're not seeing any gain in throughput. Uh, that's the red dot there. So where would you autoscale here? Right? You want to autoscale in one of the blue points if you are very latency sensitive. Right? Here you can see the green point is a little over 100 millisecond. Uh, if you want to stay to like 50 or 25 millisecond, you would autoscale on one of the bluer points there. Um, if you want to autoscale on throughput, you want to catch the green point as well as you can. Right, because you are getting the maximum throughput and your latency is not terrible. Um, you, you can also see the batch size and queue size uh, that are, are listed along each of those points. You can see batch size uh, growing from like five all the way up to 250 when we hit the inflection point, uh, which is when queuing starts to happen and the queue size starts to increase. Right? Uh, so what can we recommend uh, with this latency profile? Uh, we can recommend two things. Uh, if you want low latency auto scaling, you would set it up to use batch size, uh, like we saw. The other option is to use KV cache usage percentage, uh, like we did during the demo. Right? Both of these approaches work. Uh, one challenge with batch size is that uh, based on your request length, uh, the context length itself, your batch size will vary. Right? If you have like longer context, your batch size will be shorter. If you have shorter context, batch size will be longer. So you need to dynamically identify that, which might be harder. Uh, which is where KV cache usage actually helps. Because this is a percentage, so you can just set a number like 50% or 70% based on where you want uh, uh, the point to be in that latency profile where you want to actually do the auto scaling. Uh, and for maximum throughput, we recommend using queue size. Uh, queue size is a good indicator because when, the, when we are operating at max throughput, that's when we start to actually queue the request. So once you notice you're starting to queue, uh, that is your queue to auto scale, uh, so that you are able to hit maximum utilization and not incur too much latency. Uh, the only drawback is that obviously queue size is a lagging indicator, so you use it only when you don't care about latency as much. Uh, to wrap up, I want to point to uh, some of the ongoing work around this in the community. Uh, so we have a benchmarking work stream where we are trying to benchmark LLM workloads well uh, and produce uh, cool little graphs like the one you saw before. Um, so this is happening in Kubernetes workgroup serving, where we are doing it in a model server agnostic way. We are analyzing how we can improve auto scaling, load balancing, and all of that uh, with this. Uh, we also have the instance gateway project, which is trying to automate uh, the auto scaling and load balancing based on how your uh, models are performing. Um, that's a cool project to be part of as well. Um, and call to action, um, if you found this interesting and you would like to participate uh, in this and help make this better, uh, please uh, show up to any of the Kubernetes serving uh, working group meeting. Uh, you can also participate in the open telemetry, uh, GenAI semantic conventions and instrumentations SIG. Uh, where we are standardizing metrics, adding new metrics, traces, and all of it uh, to make this better. Uh, that ends our presentation. I will answer any questions. Thanks. Hi there. Um, very cool talk. A um, couple of questions. The first one is the auto scaling. Have you have you uh, tried these for different workloads, like in a long context or video gen? And do you see the same kind of recommendations for each of these, or do you have different recommendations for long context? And you know, let's say long context to start with. Uh, second, um, I, I think like uh, the uh, you know the prefill versus the decode disaggregation. Um, do you have any suggestions on like how do you uh, auto scale? Uh, you know, in the scenario where you're separating these out. Yeah. Uh, so to answer your first question, uh, we have experimented with uh, longer context and shorter context, uh, but mainly with text, though. We haven't done like video or multimodal uh, models yet. 
but these recommendations should kind of work uh, the same with both short and long context. Obviously, like if you are prefill heavy and are decode heavy, uh, the point where you want to order scale might differ, but using something like KV cache utilization kind of uh, makes it easier where you don't have to tune it individually. Uh, so yeah, at least that's where we are. We want to do other Gene AI workloads, image generation, uh, video and all that too in the future. Uh, to answer your second question, uh, disaggregated serving will definitely change some of the things, right? Obviously, we will prefill and decode will be handled separately. So we might want a separate auto scaling mechanism for when we actually scale up the prefill servers versus when we do decode servers. Uh, so there we are just waiting for the community to get to a point where disaggregated serving is uh, something that is being used. For example, VLLM has full support for it and all of that. Um, yeah, so their recommendations could change a bit, uh, but yeah, we are just keeping track of where we are there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so my question is for uh, auto scaling the LLM pod. Have you tried the uh, VPA as opposed to HPA? Like, will it make it any better, or it's, it's the same, like two minute delay? Yeah. So uh, VPA is a lot harder uh, compared to HPA, mainly because, let's say, you got like um, L4 GPUs set up. Uh, now, if I want to scale up and go to like uh, get like a H100 GPU instead. Uh, usually you might not have capacity, uh, so it is harder to just uh, pick a different machine. One thing you could potentially do is like maybe instead of using one GPUs, you can use more, right? Uh, you can increase tensor parallelism and use like four GPUs instead. Uh, so there, what we find is in a lot of cases, uh, tensor parallelism adds some overhead where it might be better to actually horizontally auto scale and use four GPUs instead of scaling your uh, workload vertically to use four GPUs. Yeah. 